Welcome to Spectrum Perspectives, real talk with parents, professionals, and autism advocates with your host, Cindy Gellermini. Hi, everyone. This is Cindy with another episode of Spectrum Perspectives. And today I have a special guest on today, Barbie Vartanian. Hi, Barb. How are you? Thanks for being here. Hi, Hi Cindy. Thanks for having me. So um, the two of us did an interview a year ago. We were on Jersey First TV. That was actually how I met you. We have a mutual friend that interviewed us as autism moms. And, um, and I said back then, I said, I'm going to get you to come and do my podcast. And uh, it's taken me a while to get around because I had to sort of figure out my podcast first, you know, like what type of direction it was going to go in. Uh, and that type of thing. So I like to sort of lump episodes together that are similar. So I, I try to record like a few, you know, ahead of time and then lump them together. So I'm not sure where I'm going to put you yet <laughs> because you fit <laughs> into two categories. That's why. That's okay. You're, you're a mom, but you also, you also run a business that's kind of related as well. So we're going to talk about both today. Okay. Perfect. So, um, so you are a mom and you have, what do you have? You have two kids. You have a daughter and a son, correct? Two kids. Yes, correct. Okay. And is your daughter the older one? Yes. Mary Lee is 14 and Sam is 13. So 12 months apart. Oh yeah. They're close. Okay. Yes. All right. Terrific. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I always ask the same questions when you were pregnant with your son and what's his name? Sam. Sam. When you were pregnant with Sam, um, were there any kind of red flags, uh, when you went for your visits, doctor visits or anything? You know, um, a little bit. So, what you know, of course, I was advanced maternal age. My folder was stamped all over AMA. So um, so I was thir 39 when I delivered Sam. Um, and so Sam didn't move as much as Mary Lee did when, you know, um, in utero. So I was always kind of like, but then I always, because they were so close together, like the whole thing was such a whirlwind that I don't know how much, how closely I was really paying attention to it. But I would think that that was the only thing that I thought was maybe a potential red flag is Mary Lee was like pinging around like a, you know, a lunatic in there. And, you know, who knows if that was girl versus boy, you know what I mean? But right. he didn't, not as much movement. So that was kind of the only thing other than that, it was an easy pregnancy, you know, nothing out of the normal otherwise. Mm -hmm. And what about the delivery? Did that go uh, well? Deliver well, no. So delivery, of course, I delivered Sam on the busiest night in the hospital. And so this poor doctor, I think he delivered 12 babies that night. And so um, Sam, so they gave me the epidural and Sam's blood pressure dropped really, really low, like significant to where the, they were saying, oh gosh, if this doesn't rebound in the next you know, minute, we're going to have to do an emergency C-section. So thankfully it did come back up. Um, and so delivered, everything seemed fine. Apgar's score was good. Um, and then, and then another crazy thing. So they took Sam for his circumcision and, um, then he stopped eating in the hospital and he dropped a ton of weight. So like, it's just funny, like anytime I did any sort of like kind of medical intervention with Sam, he always reacted very significantly to it. So, um, so as soon as we were released from the hospital, they literally made me take him straight to the pediatrician because of the weight loss. So we take him, we did, you know, we, she, you know, said, oh, you know, I'm not too concerned, but if he doesn't put it on in the next like week or so, then we'll, we'll revisit. And he ended up doing that and that was fine. Um, you know, and he hit his, um, for the most part, he hit all of his milestones. Um, but the inoculations for Sam were rough. You know, we did the first series, um, and he was the kid that, you know, 102 fever, he didn't, he was lethargic for two days. And I was like, oh gosh, this is kind of strange because Mary Lee was fine, no problems. Then we went to the next round of um, inoculations. And I remember asking the pediatrician, I'm like, should we wait? Like he didn't really do well the first time. And she was old school. She's like, no, just do it. You know, everything will be fine. And so I did the next round. I think he was six months, same thing, 102, 103 fever, mm. move for two, um, two or three days. And I was like, Ugh. So, and it's not that I think it is. I don't think Sam's immune system was ready for whatever I was injecting him with. And had we slowed the series, perhaps, which I know a lot of moms do nowadays, like they seem to have more success with that. So I'm not necessarily blaming it on that. Um, mm -hmm. Although back then I absolutely was. Um, you know, and then I stopped after that. Like I stopped inoculating him. He never has had um, um, a shot since then because I was just you know, I was afraid of the unknown and I wasn't sure of what, you know, I just, he, he was diagnosed very early on. So I was like, 
no, we've got enough stuff that we're going to be dealing with. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to forego these until I absolutely positively can't any longer. Um, so I've been fortunate that I've been able to um, sidestep it <laughs> in the schools and everything as well. So. Yeah, it, yeah, that's very interesting. And thank you for using the the inoculation word and not the V word because you know yeah, I'll, right. get, I'll, I'll get booted <laughs> off of YouTube if we say it. Um, <laughs> and this is why, you know, I, I kind of, I didn't say it to you ahead of time, but I tend to tell everybody kind of the reason why I ask these questions is because I'm getting at that. I'm like, what are you thinking is the cause or, or not, you know, whatever. Um, so how old, what age are we talking about here at the 18 months, a year, 18 months, two years? like what are we talking about like for diagnosis you... yeah even even earlier than that so I had a girlfriend who lived on my street who had um her son older had autism and so she um saw Sam as a very young little guy he was probably just over a year and he would do this like repetitive thing where he would just constantly like shake his head back and forth mm -hmm. and then like his eyes would get kind of googly and glazed, but then he would laugh afterwards. So I kept going, well, maybe it's just something silly he likes to do, you know? And at this point, obviously, you know, 10 months, I know sometimes, you know, we get the mamas and the dadas, you know, 10, 12 months, none of, none of that really. Um, but again, nothing really to be alarming, alarmed of because he was hitting his milestone. So she said, I think you should have the regional center because that's what they call it in California. They send the regional center out, they handle all early interventions. So they sent someone out, he was probably a year and a half and they did the stack the blocks and they did all those types of things. And they said, yeah, let's, let's begin services. They're not allowed to diagnose. So they're like, you need to go find a pediatrician to diagnose Sam. So of course, all of us understand this, that live it, you know, getting on the wait list to get into the best, you know, developmental pediatrician. So it took me like six months to get into this one place that came highly recommended from my neighbor and from others. And so we got in and it was, it was just the most crazy appointment. So the woman, literally, the doctor spent literally five minutes with Sam um, <laughs> and said, yep, he's, he's autistic. I'm going to send in a counselor. She's going to talk to you and here, you know, here you go. You're off and running. So wow. she sent this, this counselor in and it really wasn't even about Sam or services or, you know, next steps. It was you and your husband are going to be divorced in the next six months. Wow. Families families don't make it family. Wow. And I was like, I go, and I looked at her and I said, you know what? I said, if we get divorced, it's not going to be because of Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I have me. never heard that. I never yeah. heard that. Wow. Yeah. And so that's why I know, you know, because I am in this, you know, space per professionally, so much of what needs to be focused on is the delivery of a diagnosis, any kind of diagnosis. But when families are learning, you know, that their child has autis autism and they may have all of these, you know, life challenges, there's a way in which, or you, you deliver a child with Down syndrome and you weren't expecting one, like, what does that look like? Like, and I know that there's organizations now that are, that are um, evolving, that actually are focusing on that. When a child's born with a disability, how do you deliver the news to where it's a positive, not a shameful like okay, I'm not sure you know your life is now not so great like you know what I mean like shifting the script and so um yeah so I thought that was interesting I tell that story all the time how funny Sam's initial diagnosis was and it was I was like okay <laughs> mm. yeah. and how old is he yeah. now Sam's 13 now yeah okay okay, okay. yeah so yeah. so <laughs> you did end up getting divorced though right <laughs> you did end up getting to but just you know in the last three years so but I right you know, so it wasn't in six I, months so she wasn't right about that yeah she wasn't right about that and you know I mean and there's a lot of reasons to that but we didn't I mean you know a lot of times you don't agree on you know the the path you know and I was very like I wanted to follow my girlfriend's path because she was able so her son was nonverbal till he was probably three or four but my girlfriend was just diligent about services and interventions and anything possible. I mean, she quit her, and she was fortunate to be able to quit her job and to just focus entirely on her son. I didn't have that opportunity. I had to continue to work to, you know, so my insurance could pay for the services for Sam and all those types of things. So, um, you know, so we differed in some of the ways in which we went about things, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, it wasn't because of Sam. So right. yeah, right. yeah right. I'm not gonna blame that yeah. on him. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just when I started doing the podcast though, the first six months that I interviewed were all divorced. So I said, you know, this is, there's a trend here. <laughs> there's a trend. 
trend. There's definitely a trend. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got, and it's and it's very stressful um, to to raise the kids. And if the, I think, yeah, I think know, that's you know, more what it is, the stressful mm -hmm. thing. So that just lends itself it just to shining a pressure. light. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. So, so he gets a diagnosis and then I know things are different in California because I've talked to people in different States and, um, uh, it sounds like the services out there are pretty good. You know, they give them a lot. No, is it, was yeah. that your experience or, um, I would say yes and no. So, um, so the, the, the early intervention stuff was great. I mean, zero to three, you are taken care of. Like you have, you have an army at, at your disposal. It's covered. You have a case manager. They, they meet it. They check in with you very, very uh, it's frequently. Covered by the state? Yeah, covered okay. by the state. So, and then three hits and you're, and it's like, you're on your own. Like, so you have to, you have to figure out how you're going to continue the services you know, and, and a lot, of, so think about how much has changed, even at Sam just being 13, like, you know, ABA therapy was still a fight, like it wasn't, you know, initially covered by most plans. So it was trying to find, you know, a, a carrier that would cover it so that I could continue as ABA and same with the speech and the OT and things like that. So you had to then figure all that out. And so then I did, um, I did all the school assessments, you know, he was ready supposedly to go, you know, go into school. And I went through that process and it was horrible. Um, mm -hmm. And I had my, my girlfriend who, you know, you know, quasi diagnosed Sam became my advocate through that, the school system process, cause she went through it. And it was so funny. The first meeting that we went into, I brought her and you should have seen the looks on their faces. They're like, oh gosh, they brought Daisy. She brought <laughs> Daisy. They were like, and I was like, I was loving it because she was just, she was that person that you needed to just like ignite, you know, all sorts of like questioning and, mm -hmm. and saying, gosh, you know what, that's not acceptable, or this isn't the best possible placement for Sam. And, and really understanding that you as a parent have every right to say, no, this isn't, a, you know, this isn't going to work for us. I think we can do better. Or I want my IEP to be what it is actually supposed to be an individualized education plan that supports the best possible outcomes for my son. And that's not what we were given. So we went all the way up to arbitration um, and they finally conceded to some of what we were asking for, but I just knew that it wasn't the right placement. So Sam was always in a private, you know, preschool, kindergarten, first grade with one-on-one -on -one support through my insurance. And he did great. Sam was super good about emulating his peers. And if they were standing up, he stood up. And, you know, if they were coloring, he would color. You know, he didn't have the language, but he did a really nice job in those environments. And the teachers loved him. The students loved him. And then when things changed was, so he was, um, so one of the private schools he was in, so he was going into first grade. And so that's the shift from, you know, a lot of movement in the classroom and play and, you know, just a more, you know, easygoing environment to a little bit more like you've got to sit in your desk, at, you know, in your chair for much longer. It's a little bit more academic. And so that's when the wheels fell, fell off the bus. Sam, that's when we first experienced Sam's behavior flip. Like, he, um, by the time we eventually pulled him out of there, he was wearing a helmet to school. He was being pulled out of the classroom all the time. He was, you know, trying to slam his head. He was becoming um, not so much aggressive, just more self-aggressive stuff. Thankfully, he never lashed out at a teacher, his, his um, you know, the aide that was with him, all those things, but he definitely was starting to hurt himself. So we pulled him out of there. We tried to homeschool him for a little while, but Sam's like such a social kid, like that that wasn't the right thing. So so those next couple years were really difficult. So then I found a friend who was homeschooling her two boys. They were on the spectrum as well. And so she said, hey, you know, she, she was also his, she taught Sam how to swim. She was started out as his swim coach. And so I would take him to their house and it seemed to be okay, but it wasn't perfect. Like it wasn't, he wasn't getting what he needed. So, and that was right around the time when I started looking into coming out here and, and moving and, and things and seeing what life was going to be like for Sam in New Jersey. Um, and so we found an, I found an advocate out here through my brother. 
um, who's on the board at ECLC, which is one of the schools oh. here in Chatham. And I'm also now on the board there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so Bruce Littinger, and he was a head of spe uh, special education for the district for many, many years. So I had many phone calls with him. And after talking to him, I was like, oh my gosh, I sh we should have moved to New Jersey a long time ago. So it, the services are much better here for at least that under, um, you know, 18 and under, 21 and under. And then from what I hear is California is a little bit better than we are on the adult services. So it's funny how you hear state to state, like either it's really good for the kids or it's not so good for the adult programming. And so it's just this crazy world that we live in where we're trying to find the best possible, you know, services and outcomes for our kids. Yeah. So. And, and it's interesting to talk to a couple of different parents that, that move to different states to try to get them those services. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard, well, and then, you know, so in New Jersey, we have the highest incidence of autism as, as anywhere in the country, but it's not because there's something in the water. It's because a lot of parents and families move here because the services are good. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I've asked that question. I'm like, is yeah. that why? Are we being diagnosed more? Is it because people are moving here or, or I think it's a combination? I think it's a combination. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, does does so does your son go to ECLC? I'm assuming he does. He doesn't. So Sam. Oh. So we moved here. We did. Um. You know, we went through. They they took his IEP from California. We sat down and met before school started. And I remember sitting at the, around the table, and I was blown away by the te like the the level of expertise of everyone that was sitting there that was going to be Sam's teacher. So Sam was uh, went to. So we moved here. Sam. I Third, third grade to the third it was third fourth and fifth at um, Wyoming so that's where the ABA classroom is here in Milburn and his teachers my goodness all of them graduates of Rutgers who has an incredible special education program and each one of them had their specialized in the in certain fields and areas and ABA and speech and so I was like oh my gosh because we didn't have that in California there wasn't one teacher that had gone through any sort of specialized program or had a real true understanding of the population and and how to you know ignite learning so yeah so he was there for two years or three years his, his teachers were unbelievable and this is <laughs> Wyoming that's just a public school right it's yeah not, public school in Milburn yeah and so and it was funny we looked at some other places but Bruce sitting there with us he said you are not going to get better placement he's like they're giving you absolutely everything you're asking for and he said and until that changes let's leave him here so Sam just transitioned to middle school this year um, I'm on the fence. I'm trying to do my due diligence and, and ride it out. Um, I, I, it was funny. They asked me to come in and do a tour because we were away on vacation when they did the actual middle school tour for the families and went in and I went to Sam's classroom and I was like, huh. There was only him and one other little girl, and she was, um, not only did she seem like she was on the spectrum, but she also seems like she had some medical complexities, and I was like, well, where's everyone else? They said, where, because I knew a bunch of his kids that he, a bunch of his little friends that were in his class last year had moved up, so I said, where is, you know, I was naming off all the kids, and they're like, oh, well, Sam, they're all in, so they have kind of a higher functioning group, and then they have a lower functioning group that Sam was in. And I was like, well, how much are they integrated with them? Like how much, because Sam was so looking forward to seeing them again. Like we had, you know, given him all the social stories and said, you're going to see this person and this person. And, um, and they're like, oh, well, we do some. And so I don't know. They go out into the community a lot, which I know Sam loves. He loves going to places. So they do, they'll go to the mall or they'll go to the diner or they'll take them to ShopRite and teach them, you know, how to pay the cashier and all those types of things. So I think those things are good. Um, I'm, you know, again, I don't know if, if it's, you know, I'd like to see him a little bit more integrated with at least the other classroom, and I'm not sure that that's going to happen, so I'm not really sure. You know, one of the things Bruce told me when I moved here was, you know, the early education, you know, um, kindergarten to fifth or sixth grade, that's when it's great in the public school systems, and when most parents look to transition out somewhere to a school like ECLC or, or somewhere else, um, it typically happens in middle school. Like that kind of seems where that's the, the cliff. And so I don't know, I'm still waiting to see what I'm going to do with him. I have not decided yet. Yeah. So. yeah. Just for people that don't know, ECLC is a school for special needs kids. Um, and the way I describe it is like my son went to the developmental learning center. That was for kids more on the severe end um the, which was which was my son e ECLC was a little higher functioning than 
then you know you're not supposed to use functioning labels i don't I, so i i hesitate because i don't know how i'm supposed to word things but i know um, they keep changing the language on us that we're and i always feel like we get a pass because as a parent i'm like i'm gonna say what i yeah you know <laughs> like you can't tell people who live it and breathe it and every day right. that what words we're allowed to use so yeah yeah I yeah, say that. yeah I'm like please can we not get hung up over puzzle yeah. pieces and, and stuff that is right. just it, it's nonsense right. you know let's exactly. let's talk about the things that are really important um right. but just because you know people will listen to this all over the country they're not going to know what ECLC is so, right sorry so, yes, um, yes that's what it is but I am hoping to interview um the people that own Ceriso Kitchen which is a restaurant and they close on Mondays and they bring students in from ECLC on Mondays um right to teach them you know skills yeah. and job skills and stuff which is really great so that's, yeah, that's why no, I wanted that's... to find a little spotlight on that yeah yeah and yeah, so yeah, your no, brother's on the awesome. board of ECLC. Yeah, my brother. Yeah, my brother. And then they asked, and then Bruce asked me to be on it. Like I think a year after I, I moved here, so I'm on the board as well. So okay. Oh, so you're on the board, and your son doesn't even go there. No, and I don't, and I don't think Bruce thinks that that's the best place for Sam either. So, um, so again, we're, and I'm gonna, I'm totally drawn a blank on the one school that he wanted me. Uh, I think it's Life Spectrum 360. Is yes, that yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I actually know because of my work career, I know the gentleman who just moved there uh, that's now the new executive director. He used to be at um, the CTC Academy out in Oakland that's more medically complex, medically fragile kids. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, so I, I may, I, again, look at that. Um, I'm really, am excited though. Um, the middle school just um, integrated the Special Olympics Inclusive Health Program. They didn't, they had it at the high school, but they did not have it at the middle school. So mm -hmm. through um, my connections with the Special Olympics, we're, they're starting that on Tuesday. So I'm excited about, you know, just getting the student body more familiar with our kids and, you know, and letting them integrate a little bit more. And so, so that's yeah. Oh, so let's week. talk about that. Let's talk about Special Olympics. What are you doing with that? Well, so I've, so I've worked with them a ton on what I do in the oral health space around disability. And so um, it was funny when I was moving out here, I was at the um, national games in Washington. And at the time I was working for uh, another oral health um, organization and I ran their philanthropic arm and we had a mobile unit, a mobile dental clinic, and we had it at the games. And so the contingency from New Jersey came by and the gentleman who started the healthy athletes program at the special Olympics said, Hey, this girl's moving to New Jersey. You have to take care of her. She's got a son. And, and so they went back to leadership here in New Jersey and said, Hey, you know, the woman who's running, you know, these dental clinics at the Special Olympics Games is moving, maybe she can help us elevate our oral health piece of what we do. And so I met with, you know, the gentleman who oversees all that. And he suggested, um, you know, that, or he told me that he, they wanted to start doing more of, instead of just doing screenings, which are wonderful, they wanted to actually be able to provide care. So if an athlete went through the screening process and, and a, you know, a filling was identified that they needed or, you know, an extraction or something like that, we could actually do the work. So we're starting to do that now. We've done our third clinic where, you know, we have mobile units on site and we have, you know, volunteer dentists and hygiene Genus, every athlete's getting, you know, cleanings at these, um, at their games or whatever they're participating in. So yes, it's been really great. So I work, uh, so I'll be at the games in Orlando or in um, June, beginning of June. There's a conference um, and a group that I'm affiliated called the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. They do their annual conference in conjunction with the Special Olympics because we all end up partnering with one another. So, um, so yeah, so that's my connection to them. And now Sam, you know, Sam's doing snowshoeing and basketball and um, swimming. And so he's gotten really involved in all that, which is great. So yeah, we have a family yeah. friend who uh, he's going to be in the Special Olympics. He's going to be playing soccer. So. Oh, is he going to Orlando? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah, so yeah, great. Yeah. yeah, Sam. Yeah. yeah. No, Sam's not quite that competitive. So he's just, <laughs> he'll do, I'm crossing my fingers he has a, a swim competition tomorrow morning to make it to the the summer games here that are okay. actually like literally like they kind of cross over they're you know they've got the games down in Orlando but New Jersey lined up their games very closely to when those are happening so hopefully Sam makes it so yeah yeah, yeah. Robbie yeah. did Special Olympics one year and they had him run uh, because one of his aides that worked at his day program is a, she's a runner and uh, she would get him to run all the time and I had to <laughs> 
I had to go to, they just ran a straight line on the track and I waited for him at the end, you know, and I was trying to get yeah. him to come, come to me, come yeah. to me, you know, and like, and then right before he got off, got to the end, he just ran off to the side, like the other <laughs> way, and I'm like, well, okay, <laughs> this isn't going to work, you're supposed to no. go across the finish line, but yeah, yeah. that was our, oh, that no. was our experience. No, that was Sam <laughs> and snowshoeing, he just was try not really getting the concepts with the games, right. I was like, Sam, come this way yeah. and he was like just standing there I was like oh gosh. yeah you know yeah he he knew yeah. that he, they wanted him to run but he didn't understand that he's supposed to go all the way to the end to the finish line yeah <laughs> yeah I know Sam Sam doesn't understand a lot especially bat it's so funny basketball they you know pass them the ball and he like you know watches it go by or he'll yeah. duck yeah. or whatever yeah. you know so. uh does Sam speak no He's got, I, mean, I take that back. He's got some words, like if you say Sam, say hi, or Sam say, he can say a few things like, um, you know, if he wants, you know, something he'll, like every morning um, he has two waffles. So as soon as he wakes up, he goes two waffles, two waffles. So he can say a couple things to get what he needs, but he can't, like, he doesn't put sentences together for the most part. He's, you know, quiet, but he does, he can say a couple things. And how's so. this receptive? Does he understand you? Yes. He understands, okay. which is which is nice. Which is, which is I mean, I, I'm not going to say everything, but you'll mm -hmm. say, Sam, can you go get this, and he'll go get it, or you know, oh, he will, like that. Yeah, he will. Okay. Go, he will go do. You know, if it's too complex, forget it. But for the right. most part, right. if you say, Sam, go find your iPad, or Sam, go get your water bottle, he'll go get it. You know, mm -hmm. so um, and then you say, fill it up, and he'll fill it up. So he does. He does understand. Okay, good. Does, does he use a, a, any devices to communicate, or no? He doesn't know we early on we did you know some of the apps that you know he could touch on like the proloquo apps and and some of those things where you could you know he could mm -hmm. slide up things but it no it didn't really ever take and click. I don't yeah it didn't click with him so and then you know as a mom I was like no we're gonna push for language like that was my whole when I was younger that's what I or when he was younger that's what I thought I was supposed to do like no 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 we don't want you know and now I look back and I you know now you see so many kids communicating like typing and he's learning how to type so I think that'll be exciting if that's something that he's able to understand and implement that would be incredible so um I think however you can get them to communicate mm -hmm. and it and it does resonate with them and it's something they can do then I, I think it should be does he get frustrated ever that he can't communicate oh yeah yeah Definitely, definitely, mm -hmm. and and I get frustrated that I can't figure out what he's what he wants, yeah. what he needs, yeah. what's bothering yeah. him. You know, so yeah. especially when you feel like they could be in pain, you know, it's like and they oh, can't gosh, yeah. they can't tell you. Yeah, um, abs absolutely. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. for instance, M Robbie had uh, he had I think his wisdom teeth were coming in, but he had an infection. Right, there's no way for for him to tell me, and the only thing I knew is right. when I tried to brush his teeth. You know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let you, you know, brush right. the teeth. And then that was right. a trick to the dentist. So that's my segue. <laughs> yeah, I like it. That's a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me about, uh, tell me about what you do. You mentioned it a little bit with Special Olympics, but give us a better explanation. Yeah, so I am, and I just started in January, a new role. So I am the Director of Advocacy and Policy Initiatives at NYU for all things um, around disability and oral health. And so, I mean, it's such a, a cool thing. They created the position for me based on what I was doing previously, which was running a nonprofit that that's all we did. We were all about increasing access to care for individuals with disability around oral health um, and looking at, you know, policy initiatives and changes that needed to happen and, and trying to make sure that the dental profession is trained and proficient and competent and, and making sure that the dental schools um, have a, you know, that we're graduating that next generation of clinicians that can go out into the community and provide care and not immediately refer, you know, our population to the ORs and things like that. So that's what I was doing in that role. And so NYU, so they have an incredible center that they put in just before COVID hit, the Oral Health Center for Persons with Disability. It's a uh, 12 chair clinic, comprehensive care. It's 
unbelievable um, desensitization room, you name it, it's one-stop shop. And so I think the commitment that they made to the disability community, I think they wanted to take it one step further. And they knew that, you know, NYU is the largest dental school in the country. So they have a tremendous, you know, when NYU puts its stamp on something or they're in support of something, other schools will potentially want to emulate and follow and, and, and it, they carry a lot of clout. So, um, so they created this position. They asked if I would, would do it. And I said, yeah, I think that's, you know, I would love to, you know, and, and so I'm really, really um, excited to be there. Um, and, you know, and again, and continuing to work on what I was working on, like, you know, Medicaid, reimbursement changes and, and curriculum development for dental schools and, you know, and next generation or not next generation, but, you know, future provider, oh my gosh, I can't talk, existing providers and getting them trained and all those types of things. So, um, yeah. And so in doing so, that's how I've worked with all these national um, organizations and, you know, because it's, it takes an army to, to make change, um, you know, and it's just, incredible to just see the disparities that our population faces around healthcare. It's, it's just unbelievable, you know, seeing it as a parent, but then also seeing it, you know, in the space itself. So um, I think I mentioned this on our last podcast and it's, I think it's telling for a lot of people because they don't, they can't fathom it, but access to oral healthcare is the number one unmet healthcare need for our population. There are no, there aren't providers out there, you know, because the, those that are in the workforce, they weren't trained because it wasn't a requirement of the dental school. Now it is. They made, Mm. um, they changed the, um, the Council on uh, Dental Accreditation just changed their requirements that every dental student has to have some sort of understanding and proficiency. No longer is it okay for them to just say, I'm going to refer them to a pediatric dentist because in pediatrics, they do have exposure to the special needs community, but the general practitioners did not. So we're changing that. It was changed just a couple of years ago, COVID hit. So now schools are really now having to start to implement that. And so we're working on this national curriculum project with other academic institutions across the country to make sure that every school you know, has what they need so that they can quickly implement something um, and, and again, teach that next group that will, you know, care for the population. So, yeah, that's interesting because when Robbie did need his wisdom teeth pulled out, I had called an oral surgeon. Um, and as soon as I said he was autistic, he refused to see him. And right. I'm like, I'm like, excuse me? He's like, and, and they just, you know, made no apologies. They said, no, he just, he won't see anyone with special needs. You have to find someone else. Um, we did have a dentist that did pediatric and special needs, right? We did go to him. Um, and when he needed something, um, I don't remember what it was, but he needed some type of dental work done, even just having a cavity filled, I think. We, we actually took him to the hospital and put, and, you know, put him out um, so that he could do that. And then, and when he needed the wisdom teeth, I, I must have mentioned it to probably on Facebook or something. Who knows? I, I don't know. I remember I mentioned it somehow that the doctor refused to see him. And my friend's husband was an oral surgeon and he said, I will see him, bring him to me. And, and he kind of, he did sort of that sedation dentistry where he was sort of half out and, you know, right. and, and did that. Right. Um, but that, and that's a whole other topic is how medications oh, yeah. work on these kids and, and things that were supposed to knock him out, don't make him out, they knock him out, right. just kind of loopy and all that. But, um, right. but, but I know what you're talking about, you know, I, I understand. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I did an interview before you with a doctor that his son needed medical care and he had the same experience. He called that they refused to see his own son because he had special needs. And he's like, you gotta be kidding me. So, um, and he said the same thing that you're saying is that, uh, you know, the doctors need to be exposed more to, you know, and need some training in how to deal with special needs and and autistic population. And so he's trying to do some things, um, to change that in the medical field. And I'm glad to see you're doing it in the dental field because I think it's something people don't think about until, until you have an autistic child and people refuse to see your child, right? Right, right. And the funny thing is, Robbie, because he was kind of hyposensitive and he liked pressure and stuff, he liked needles. They didn't bother him. Like, oh, like he, we'd go to the pediatrician and they'd bring in three people to because thinking they have to hold him down. And he would just sit there and go, hmm, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> and he liked going to the dentist because I guess he liked the pressure or something. So my dentist loved Robbie. Like when he couldn't go to pediatric anymore, I said, all right, let's try bringing you to my dentist. And he was, Robbie was his favorite patient. 
because he was yeah. so good. No, that's awesome. So, yeah. 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 I know there's, there's just a lot to that. So, and most of it, so pediatrics is actually an age defying specialty in dentistry. So now, you know, that, that transition is like the cliff, like that's what we all call it in dentistry. Cause there's nowhere to transition them to. So, you know, and the other thing is, is, you know, statistically like 95% of our population can be seen in a regular clinic, you know, but you know, it's just the lack of, you know, experience and knowledge and understanding of the community. And, you know, and the also the big problem is, is they think that sedation is the only way that they can, they need to treat our kids. And that's not, right. you know, right. we all in the community know that there's so many different types of behavioral modifications and interventions that can happen prior to that. I mean, there'll always be a place for sedation dentistry and for, you know, individuals to have to be. I need it. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm afraid I mean, of needles. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> So that's always there and, and obviously there's you're talking about you know extreme behaviors or medical mm -hmm. complex individuals that have to absolutely positively have to be taken to the OR but mm -hmm. unfortunately it's being utilized um, in excess for our population sure, and that sure. that cannot absolutely cannot happen you know you, why would you the risk versus the reward is not there so mm -hmm. um, so yeah so that's kind of what I focus on is trying to change all of the you know or remove some of the barriers that are out there and that's yeah so what if someone doesn't have dental insurance that's a great question um well so and that's a whole you know a whole other can is the medicaid issue so most individuals that have a child um or somebody that they care for you know you have access to medicaid um and so hopefully that that's an option, but there's so many providers out there that don't take Medicaid because the reimbursement is so low. So that's one of the other things that we're trying to work on is increasing reimbursement. And, um, you know, the National Council on Disability just put out a very extensive report um, that was given to the president on the Medicaid issues around, for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's wonderful, but you know, is it getting into the hands of the people that can make the changes, you know, and can understand what needs to take place? So we're actually working um, on redistributing this um, this paper and sending it at all to you know to key legislators to say, hey, this came out. Did you read it? And yeah. here, you know, there's incredible recommendations. And so we're going to circle back and do some some virtual hill days and start talking to some members and say, hey, we need you to get on board with us. We need Is this done help. at the state level or federal? That, both federal and state. We're, I mean, we're tra trying to tackle it anywhere we can. So, mm -hmm. you know, you get some wins at the state level. Hopefully then it gets the attention at the federal level. So we're kind of going. All right. I'll, I'm going to talk to you offline about um, a connection with somebody at the on the state level that is oh, trying great. to help special needs community as much as possible. So maybe right. awesome. um, you could set up a meeting with Yeah, them. that would be great. Cause I'm also on the task since I live here, I'm on the task for New Jersey, um, well, the oral health coalition, but we have a special needs task force. And so I'm on that as well with, you know, people from ARC and Special Olympics and the, um, um, the New Jersey chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And so it's, it's a great group. And then the the one woman who with oversight over um, all the Medicaid, um, all the MCOs, the yeah managed care organization. So um, yeah, I'd love to because I'm trying to help them as much as I keep telling the gal who runs our group. I'm like, let's have New Jersey be the first to do this or the first to do that, or let's mm -hmm. let's try and make some of those inroads. So yeah, yeah, that's how I feel. I keep saying, you know, we have the highest amount of autism in the entire country, then we should be the first at so many things. We Absolutely. should be the best, the top, the pioneer at, you mm -hmm. know, whatever, that everybody else should be following this. Here's how they do it in New Jersey, you know? Yep. Uh, yeah, I agree 100%. So um, I, I want to know a little bit more about, because I, I didn't realize you had switched jobs now and that you were working at NYU. I want to know a little bit more about who, who you were working before. Do, does it still exist? Is it still? Is it does. Yeah. So okay. it still exists. So it's, it was called, it's called a Project Accessible Oral Health. And so it was founded by um, a gentleman at Henry Schein, which Henry Schein is the largest medical and dental supplier in the country. And then um, the dean, the current dean at Penn Dental Medicine. So he was at NYU at the time that we started and now he's at Penn. Um, and so it was really just created to be this convener of organizations that would collectively come together. So 
up until very recently, it was very siloed. Like one group was working on this or one group was trying to do that, but nobody was getting there. And so the gentleman from Henry Schein, who's all about collaboration and understanding that, you know, we all together move, you know, can move the mountain, but us all as one little unit probably aren't going to get too far up the hill. So, um, so that's what we are and that's what we become. And so we have all these great um, organizations involved in um, PAOH and same thing, working on the same issues, policy initiative. We actually are just about to launch a national campaign around just the awareness of, you know, the accessibility for oral health and people with disabilities. And it's, you know, and the um, campaign was funded by Henry Schein, Colgate, Delta Dental, so we've got some big players. So um, I think the more even people that aren't, you know, that don't have a loved one with somebody with a disability or aren't a dentist, like I think just trying to get the public at large to understand the disparities, hopefully we can start some sort of grassroots momentum and, and make changes and things like that. So. But you mentioned taking a mobile clinic to, to, to the uh, Special Olympics. Did they do that? No, that like was part of that was that. that was part of so before PAOH when I was in, living in California I worked What's for What's PAOH? Uh, Project Accessible Oral Health. Oh okay. Yeah. Yeah, so when I was in California, I worked for Pacific Dental Services, which is one of the largest dental support organizations in the country. So those are your they, you know, they classify them as your corporate dentistry, but the model at, at this organization was different than most that are out there. And so we had a, a really wonderful philanthropic arm and I ran the foundation for them. And one of the programs that I started was to make sure that our dental professionals were trained and could be able to treat, you know, somebody with a disability. And so I, we had a mobile dental clinic and initially we were, you know, going to rural communities and traveling across the country and providing care for, you know, kind of disadvantaged communities. But then I started this relationship with the Special Olympics and they said, you know, hey, can we bring the your mobile unit to the World Games in Los Angeles? And I was like, absolutely. So, you know, so we were there on site for that. And then we started doing other local Special Olympics events and bringing the unit there. And then again, we were at the National Games in, in, um, in Washington. So no, so that was, but you know, the hard, the hard part with the mobile units is, you know, people get one and they think it's gonna be great and they're gonna use it and then they don't use it. So PDS is no longer using their mobile unit anymore, which is such mm -hmm. a shame. And it's a waste, but the expense and the overhead and every, and the wear and tear on the units and things like sure, that. Sure. like. So the, the mobile units are tough, um, the mobile vans, but yeah, so, but it was great when we were doing it. I mean, we provided a lot of care and, um, and able to keep things like, you know, a lot of times people were worried that it was going to be too much stimuli to come on there, but it, we never ran into any trouble with the athletes. They seemed to love it. Um, so we did pretty well with that. Good. And so now at NYU, you said you had 12 chairs. So is this like a clinic that people can come? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a clinic that they treat and they, I mean, it's in incredible. So yeah, anybody can, can go there. Yeah. It's a, this is for specifically for people with special needs. Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's called, it's called the oral health center for persons with disabilities. Um, and it's, you know, it's uh, 44 and 44th and no wait, 433 and first Avenue. Um, and it's part of the dental school, obviously. Okay. But they have okay. incredible, the, the director there is unbelievable. And so, yeah, they're doing, they're doing great things in the clinic and they have the capacity to, you know, to treat anyone. So if somebody can't find care here in New Jersey, they can absolutely go um, to the center there. That, would, that was my question. Yeah. You know, if you yeah, have to absolutely. be a New York resident and someone no. from New Jersey, they can come or Connecticut or yeah. whatever, they can yeah. come if they want. Um, and is there a cost for it? Well, so if they have insurance, great, but I, I believe so since I am new to the, you know, to the position and the role from what I understand, if somebody can, they cover it. They, that's part of it. So I don't believe there are costs associated if somebody can't pay for the treatment, which okay. is great. All right. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So if you can, what would be the contact information? Who would they contact if they want to come? So if they go to dental.nyu.edu. Mm-hmm. And um, I think if they type in NYU Dentistry Oral Health Center for People with Disabilities, and then it right there it says to make an appointment, and there's a phone number unless you just want to put a phone number up. Yeah, you could do that. Okay, so it just says to schedule an appointment, please call 212-998-9988. Okay. 
There and then go. if they go to the and then if they go to the website, there's a little form that they can fill out online and somebody will contact them. Okay. So awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add before we close? Um no, I don't think so. No. Uh uh. I think I mean I just think this is awesome. You know, I think the more eyes we put on, you know our kids and and people having an understand a better understanding. I mean, it's just amazing to me, like when I'm out in the community, still the stares and the the side eyed looks and the, you know, and all those types of things. I, I wish people had, you know, lived a day in, in our lives. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because I'm sure, you know, like I, if, if I have a friend come visit from out of town and they stay a couple of days with us, I, they're blown away by just what's involved in in our lives and so I just wish people could remove themselves for a moment and just live in our shoes and understand how tired we are how beat down we are how you know what I mean like it's so many of us have changed our entire lives and career paths to advocate for our kids this isn't I wasn't in this space before I mean it had, I had nothing to do with it you but packed up had, and moved all the way across the country I know I packed up and moved across the country for my son and it's changed and and I I mean and what a blessing and he's changed my life so much for the better and I I'm so thankful where I've come because of him but I mean think about that like who does that but that's what we do as parents and caregivers of you know, our kids in this population is we, we have to become these tireless advocates. And I don't think people understand the level of complexity that we live with every day. Like we have, we wake up one morning and, you know, our kid could be slamming their head through the wall or, you know what I mean? And people don't get that. And so I just wish, I wish people were just a little bit more empathetic and understanding to, um, to us and to the community and to our kids into the community and you know and things like that it just in the schools I wish our kids had you know I wish the kids weren't terrible and <laughs> right you know, well and, okay and so yeah. that brings me to my books yeah. um yeah. you know when I wrote them I just wanted to just tell Robbie's story it wasn't until a teacher said to me oh I can't wait to read them to my class that I realized oh man this would be a great teaching school tool to use in schools for kids like like your son that are in a public school um and and i think if we could teach them from kindergarten age how to recognize it to understand it to be empathetic and to get it then as they become adults hopefully they'll become the doctors and the dentists and people that that they're like yeah i grew up with these kids it's it's a non-issue for me sure i'll i'll see them as a patient not a problem you know we don't get the stares and things i uh you know in the community people this is why i keep doing things publicly and throw it on youtube because now yeah. when you know if you see an autistic kid in the restaurant you know it's like oh okay yeah he's just like robbie okay <laughs> you right. know? It's right. like i get yeah. it you know and they might even go over to him and say hey buddy what's your name give me a high five you know instead of being you know being uncomfortable yeah. or whatever yeah Cause my, it, well, it's funny, you know, I'm all about making your mess, your mission. And like my poor mm -hmm. daughter, like I'm out in the community, you know, and I'll, I'll, I have no problem saying anything to anyone if I'm out and somebody's, you know, again, like either looking at Sam funny or me funny or making a comment, like I'll say something. And my daughter's like, oh, here she goes, you know, and, <laughs> and, I, and I feel bad for it, but I'm like, Mary Lee, I said, I, that's, this is my opportunity. I'm not going to let this pass. I'm not going to let somebody, you know, say something derogatory about your brother, about us. I said, and I said, this will, you know, it raises a level of awareness and I guarantee you that person's never going to do that again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and things like that. So I'm all all about just putting out there whatever I'm going through or what I've, you know, if you can help somebody, you know, uh, you know, there's some, I, I took so much comfort, you know, when Sam was younger and, and me not knowing what the heck to do, like from other parents and moms right, reaching out right. to me and saying, this is what I did, you know, and, and, and we all say, you know, you've met one child with autism, you met one child with autism and it's totally true, but there's some things that can be picked up and lifted to your world. And I was always so appreciative and thankful for, anyone that would talk to me or give me an ounce of advice or let me cry to them or whatever, you know? Yeah. A, yeah. yeah. And that's so. kind of what I, my hope was for this podcast is for other parents that are living this and going through it, that they'll listen to all these interviews and say, Hey, okay, I'm not the only one. These guys are going through the same thing I'm going through. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. And try to help them in any way I can. 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it definitely, it definitely helps that support definitely helps. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. To hear Especially it. the ones that are younger, you know, that, are, yes. that this is all new to them, you know, to hear from parents that have been going through this for a few years already, you know, and right. help them navigate yeah. everything. So. Yeah. And help them find doctors and resources and, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. all of it. So yeah. 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 And dentist. Yay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> It's so exciting, the world of dentistry, but okay. <laughs> it helps it helps us all smile. So yeah, anyway. exactly. All right, Barbie, thanks so much for yeah, joining me today. You're really appreciate it. Hope it was a lot okay. of fun having you yeah. today. Yes. And, uh, yeah. All right. You have a good night. Bye bye. Thank you. That's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed listening and it helped you gain a new perspective. If you're interested in buying our book series. Robbie's world and his spectrum of adventures. The link will be in our episode description as well as my Instagram and Facebook pages. If you enjoyed the show and you'd like more content, please be sure to hit that like button, follow us, and don't forget to leave us a great review. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to join us again on our next episode of Spectrum Perspectives. Thank you for joining us today. Be sure to join us again on our next episode of Spectrum Perspectives.